I'd like to call this meeting of the Committee on Affordability, Accountability, and Planning to order. It's uh, approximately 9.04 on September 19th. I'd like to welcome all of you um, to the, uh, I believe this is the actually the first meeting of this reconstituted committee, is it not, Mr. Chairman? Um, I would like to remind everyone that uh, this meeting is being broadcast. So uh, we expect you, and particularly the board members, to be on your best behavior. Uh, if you do have cell phones, we'd ask that you uh, silence those. In fact, I better follow my own advice here. Okay, um, I'd like to just go ahead and start uh, with the agenda. Uh, agenda item two is approval of the minutes from June 21st, 2012 meeting of the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee. Are there any questions or comments concerning the minutes? Move approval. Is there a motion is made and second. Uh, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item three is consideration of approval of the consent calendar for the Committee on Affordability and Accountability and Planning. Um, is there any question, discussion? Is there a particular item that's on the consent agenda? Uh, Move approval. Is there a second? Any further discussion? If none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item four is public testimony on items relating to um, the Committee on Strategic Planning and Policy. Uh, we do not have anyone that is registered to testify, so we'll go on to the next item. I uh, would like to notate that this is very important to us to have feedback from any stakeholder that has uh, comments or concerns about any item on the agenda. Item number 5A is consideration of staff recommendation to the board for approval of construction, rehabilitation, and property projects. Uh, number one is the University of Texas at Austin. It's to construct an engineering education and research center. Uh, Mr. Dave Dixon, Executive Director of Program Management for the University of Texas System, uh, will provide us with a presentation. Welcome, gentlemen. You would turn on your microphones. How's that? I can hear you. Great. Do we have the presentation up? There we go. Well, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again uh, for, for uh, seeing us today. Thanks to the, uh, the rest of the committee. Joining me today is Dr. Greg Fenvis. Dr. Fenvis is the dean of the Cockrell School of Engineering. <laughs> Cockrell School of Engineering is ranked as number eighth nationally. Uh, among engineering schools, and number 11, I, I'm sorry, for graduate schools, number 11th for undergraduate schools. Uh, 10 as of last week. Excellent, good news. Uh, this project, the project that you're going to see today, is central uh, to the school's vision to become a global center for technology and innovation, engineering education, and entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. Designed by the team of Jacobs Engineering and Aeneid, Aeneid sorry, Architects, this $310 million project uh, will provide approximately 433,000 gross square feet of critically needed education and research space for the Cockrell School of Engineering. It's the first and highest priority project in the strategic master plan for the college. Hensel Phelps Construction Company has been selected as the construction manager. Our intent is to proceed with critical make ready, renovation, and demolition work directly after approval of the project by this board. Funding source are, sources are shown on the slide. Next slide, please. The project's located on the north side of the campus in the heart of the Cockrell School of Engineering in an area bounded by Dean Keaton, San Jacinto, 24th Street, and Speedway. The project's intended to be a major campus entry point, and it will connect strongly with Waller Creek. It'll include inviting green spaces with lots of shade. Project will replace the functionally obsolete engineering science building 
the Computer Sciences Annex and the Academic Annex. It will also provide 36,000 gross square feet of renovation and remodel space in select areas of the Ernest Cockrell Junior Hall just north of the, uh, the building in Orange. Next slide, please. This project will provide the university with a new eight-level technology-intensive engineering facility. It will include modular labs, space for undergraduate engineering projects, interdisciplinary graduate research, and electrical and computer engineering program space. Materials and treatments will be consistent with other buildings in the area and on the campus, including limestone, significant glazing for daylighting, and uh, uh, basalt and, and, uh, uh, and panels, metal panels. In addition to the renovations I mentioned earlier to the Ernest Cockrell Junior Hall, the project will provide a new material transfer center for the campus's EH&S operations, as well as relocation of the campus's network operations center. Next slide, please. As you can see, the project meets all of the uh, coordinating board's operating uh, construction parameters, cost parameters, efficiency parameters. We request that you all would consider approval of this project and be happy to answer any questions you might have. Members, any questions? Mr. Chairman? Uh, I had just one question. <clears throat> On the project briefing that we got uh, in our uh, books prior to the meeting, it showed two tranches of, quote, other local funds, one of 17 and one of 5 million for a total of 22 million. Uh, but the presentation today uh, just shows the five million. Um, is that a correction, or has there been a change in the uh, sourcing of funds? And, and uh, specifically, what are the other local funds? I can answer that. The seventeen million are part. Of, those are local bonds. So their their ninety five million bonds shows up as designated tuition of seventy eight million and other local funds of seventeen million to make up their ninety five million. So. It's just a different way of categorizing the same money. So the 17 is in that 95. Right. Yes. Okay. And then the five million and other local funds. What? What is it? It's the cash. Other local funds. Unexpended plan cash. funds. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any any other questions? Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Before we do vote, I do have one question. The RFS bonds of 95 million. Susan, can you break that down a little? That's the revenue system financing bonds, and they're saying that they're going to pay for that in two ways. One is they're going to use designated tuition to pay for $78 million of it, and then they're going to use other local funds to pay the $17 million. So that's where those bonds are coming from. Okay. Well, Doctor, congratulations on your move up to the top ten. Uh, obviously, it's a marvelous uh, uh, program, and we commend you for that. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of approval of aye. this item, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much. Thank you. Um, I think the next item is uh, item 5A2. That's the University of North Texas University Union Renovation and Expansion in Denton, Texas. Uh, Mr. James McGuire, Vice Chancellor for Administrative Services and Chief Architect, the University of North Texas System, will pre provide a presentation. Mr. McGuire, you have some other gentlemen with you? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I'm joined by Andrew Harris, who is the Vice President for Finance and Administration at University of North Texas, and Renard Kirby, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities for the UNT System. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be here. We seek the approval uh, for construction of the University Union renovation and expansion at the UNT Denton campus. Okay, great. Uh, the, the first slide you see is the uh, rendering from the east side of the building. Uh, the project entails a complete gut renovation of the existing 
student union that was originally constructed in 1964 and last renovated in 1976 when the campus had approximately 17,000 students. Next slide. The project site is located uh, in the heart of the campus, close to Hurley Hall, which is um, the administration facility. The uh, breakout on the side shows the detailed orientation of the site plan. The existing building is to the north, and the uh, expansion is to the south. Next slide. As I mentioned, the project will completely renovate the existing facility, which is nearly 200,000 square feet. That renovation includes uh, the complete replacement of all mechanical systems which are at the end of their uh, existing life, their, their projected life, and uh, the installation of new modern facilities and systems which will be much uh, more efficient. The project also includes new construction of about 110,000 for the expanding needs of the program. That includes uh, additional space for student organizations, as well as support for all the student affairs, uh, dean of students, etc. In addition, the increased uh, and improved food service. I might mention that the renovation also includes the uh, complete new commercial kitchen, which serves all the food venues in the uh, project. The project uh, cost is $137 million, primarily funded with uh, bonds which will be paid through a student fee. Next slide. The referendum for that fee was in April of this year. Uh, design is progressing. Uh, we expect to begin construction in summer of 13 with a two-year construction period completing the project uh, in summer of 2015. The uh, standards of the coordinating board are all met with the exception of one, which is the renovation costs. Uh, as noted in your staff report, the uh, standard is based primarily on uh, renovations of projects which are more um, finish oriented and because this project includes all the mechanical systems, the, uh, our cost is slightly higher. Uh, and the last slide shows the distribution of the uh, projected financing for the project. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, if you have any. Thank you very much. Mr. McGuire, approximately what will the student fee be Andrew, could you? Uh, for, for the individual student. The students, vo the students voted for a fee increase of not to exceed $115. That is on top of an existing fee of $51. So the combined fee would be $167 because we raise that fee $1 each year uh, since it maintains the operational expenses of the completed building. Chairman, I have a question. What, what percentage of your student body participated in the election? We had 2,253 students vote. Uh, that's off a base of about 36,000 students. Uh, of the total students that voted, 54% voted yes. And what, what would that calculate as percentage-wise in terms of the participation of the students? And does that, do you feel like that represents approximately 6%. You feel like that rep is pretty representative of the entire student or a reasonable representation of the student body? Dr. Golden, it's, it's consistent with all of our previous referenda, with the exception being the uh, stadium, which had a higher participation level than uh, the rec sports center in 2000, the student health and wellness center in 2004, uh, and, and this one is consistent with those. Mayor Paul, go ahead. Uh, I've got a question, and I wanted to touch on that as well. Um, this the current design of it supports seventeen thousand. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, how many? Uh, just estimating, will the new design be able to support? You'll have thirty-five thousand now. Will it be able to support more than that, or do y'all have an estimate? Yeah. Yes. The the uh, project is designed to support continuing growth. We're we're currently looking at our uh, master plan, which 
postulates uh, an ultimate growth of the campus of almost 45,000, and we expect that this project would be able to serve those needs through that. Okay. Also on the student referendum, 6% uh, is about average from my experience with it. It's notoriously difficult to get students to vote on any issues, regardless of how important they may be. So, uh, yeah, that's about. I was going to say that's about the same as local elections. So the adults aren't any better. Chairman, yes, sir. I hear what uh, Ryan says, but still, twelve hundred students voted <coughs> yes out of thirty-six thousand. And so that basically tells me almost half of the students voted no. So you are going to make those half students, 18,000 approximately, pay this higher tuition or fees? I think the short answer to the question is, is yes. Uh, the referendum was executed in accordance with the rules as they exist. Uh, we are we're subject to them and we follow them. Uh, I will add, uh, in this case, uh, the students that did participate were, were so enthusiastic about the project that they elected to commence the fee one year before the building opens in contrast to our historical practice which is to commence the fee after the building opens and they did that so that they could realize the long-term interest savings uh, and have that that fee money uh, contribute to ongoing student programs within the facility so enthusiasm of 1200 students will subject 36,000 students to pay additional fees. Yes, sir. In exactly the same fashion as the, the Rec Sports Center, the Student Health and Wellness Center, and Apogee Stadium. Uh, to me, that's not a justification. These are not our rules, sir. Well, how in the world are you going to control the cost of education if you just keep continue to do in the same way? Or is that something you even ever take time to worry about? We're, obviously, we're deeply concerned with it. Our Board of Regents is deeply concerned with it. The administration is deeply concerned with it. Uh, these projects uh, fill a need, a demonstrated need. I, I submit to you that if you were to walk through that union on any given day while classes are in session, you would experience uh, how crowded it is, that it's bursting, with, bursting at the seams. Our freshman class this year is 10 percent higher than it was last year in terms of enrollment and uh, the services provided by a state-of-the-art student union or any student union contribute directly to retention, uh, to uh, academic performance, and to uh, getting our students through the pipeline uh, with the degrees that they're seeking in as short a time as possible. Uh, it is expensive. We recognize that, uh, but students expect it and demand it. If there's a better process out there, uh, we'd be interested in, in working within it, but, but we are following the process that exists. Well, let me suggest a process to you, sir. Uh, the institution, right before you, their project cost was, I think, in excess of $300 million, and only 25% of that amount was charged against tuition fees. In your case, it's almost 90%. Have you all made any effort to raise some private funding? There is a component of the project, uh, specifically in the bookstore, uh, that uh, will be funded uh, by the vendor. Uh, most of the vending space within the facility generates revenue, which helps offset the uh, costs of operating the facility. Uh, there is, uh, in that respect, uh, offsets that you don't see in, in the total cost of the project because they're calculated into the cost as presented. But it's, it's a great... Uh, you know, it's a great suggestion and not something we're, we're ashamed to pursue. If, if I could just get clarification, the existing building was built in 1964, is that correct? That's correct. To accommodate what was the size of 17,000 students. And you're currently at 36,000. 30, so you've class. doubled, you've doubled, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Dennis, did you have a question? You know, I, uh, I think this is a, a good project. I'm, I'm not on this committee, so I'm not allowed to vote, but I'm allowed to speak. And, you know, I think what my concern is, is and it's not necessarily directed toward your institution alone, but we, I continually see these projects brought forward. And with little participation, you know, we're passing these fees to students. And 6% and of your student body voting on that, I, I'm just not really happy with that. I think we can do better than that. And I'm not seeing this institutions instilling into the students 
a, a sense of responsibility in participating in the system itself. And if we sit back and continually be satisfied with 6% of the people voting, then how many are going to get out from your institutions and participate in the system of democracy and vote and exercise their rights to, to keep this country where it is today? I think we have a certain amount of social responsibility as, as, as leaders of these institutions to instill uh, a sense of responsibility in the students. And I'm not real sure that not just you all, but all of our institutions are not really accepting that responsibility and taking it seriously enough and sitting back and saying, okay, well, 5%, 6%, we follow the rules, that's okay. That's not okay. We got a problem when only 6% of the students are participating. And I know they're adults. I know they're allowed to make their own choices and their own decisions. I know a lot of them are working full time and juggling about 25 bowling balls all at once. But still, you know, the cost of education, We've got an arms race, I think, going on among the institutions in the state of Texas at times, trying to decide who's going to build the highest uh, climbing wall. And what we need to come together as an entire state and address, you know, what the state's needs and not sometimes just the individual institution needs. And again, I'm not trying to wail on you guys. You know, my, my comments are directed broadly not just to you all, but I'm talking about to everyone that can hear, hear my voice directly or indirectly this morning, is that I think the institutions need to make a stronger effort to get more student participation in these type of referendums. Now, I've, I've seen it. I've been on the campuses. I spent six years at University of Houston campus. They're just as guilty as, any, as, 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 as anyone else and not, and not advertising, promoting, making students aware that these referendums are, are are out there and they're important. And I just think that we need to really stop and ask ourselves, are we going to just keep doing this over and over and over and saying that 6% is good enough? And then when they get out in the real world and, and, and we vote for a presidential election, we, we, we wonder why 50% of the electorate don't even bother to go to vote. Dennis, <clears throat> in the That's interest. All I in the, in the interest of time, I think everybody kind of gets the point, uh, but we still have to consider the item that's before us today. Well, and I, I want to just, I, I just think there comes a point when you need to stop and say this, because I've been sitting on this board for three, nearly three years now, and I haven't said it, and now I've said it, I'm done. Okay. I Bob. did have a quick question on what will the, what's the plan for the, uh, functions that take place at the student union in the interim during construction, where, how's, how's that going to be filled? There's a uh, fairly detailed uh, logistical plan that moves into temporary spaces uh, the existing functions. Uh, it includes uh, moving the bookstore into a, a temporarily renovated part of a parking garage, uh, in, includes putting some food service in uh, mobile, mobile food carts nearby. Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with Munir and uh, Dennis. Uh, I think 200% increase in the tuition fee for the students with only 6% representation is not fair. Uh, I don't know if our commissioner can look at, uh, can we uh, change the guidelines uh, to be 10% or 20% or we have no jurisdiction over that. I think it's unfair. If I was a student, uh, my tuition fee went from $51 to 168 I'll be jumping up and down. And uh, so either some people did not know or maybe 6% is, uh, uh, I agree with that, 6% is not enough number. Can we increase it to 10%? Maybe Fred has some comments on this. Well, I can, uh, you know, make a suggestion that it's certainly something that we could undertake as a broad issue, not specific to this project, to investigate. Um, is there a more effective way to get, you know, a, a broader cross-section of student feedback? But regarding this project, uh, certainly UNT has followed the existing process as it, you know, it's no different than what any other university would have followed it. You know, certainly the size of the, of the uh, fee increase relative to the existing fee is a, is a significant jump. But then again, I don't know how the $51 uh, compared with other institutions to begin with. Uh, it could be that UNT's fee is 
was you know kind of behind the times, so to speak. Um, but we can ask staff to kind of take this on as a broader topic and maybe come back uh, where the oh, there you are uh, with a recommendation on um, you know I'll give you an example. Um, the foundation and and the agency are about to uh, invest a, a relatively nominal amount of money in a in a um, oh, I forget the buzzword for this type of software, but a product called Mind Mixer, which is a sort of a cloud uh, a crowd sourcing tool, uh, which with students would probably be very effective in getting student feedback. Whether it could whether it, some of these actually have the ability to be used as a voting tool. It, it would take an investigation to see if it would be secure enough. But those are the kind of th the tools that we have now that, that might result in improved student participation and feedback just because of the nature of today's students. Um, so I, I think that's something that we need to look at. Um, but at the same time, let's recognize that, you know, what we're seeing here today is, is something that's, you know, followed according to the rules. Only other comment I've got, and this is really more Susan for staff, and that is I think um, that the renovation side of this is outside of our cost uh, guidelines, but for a good reason. It's a gut and rebuild. So my question would be, uh, ought we to break that category into two categories? You know, one uh, that's uh, finished renovation and one that's total rebuild. And because we already break it down into different types of buildings and getting into very small numbers, we could look at the number of buildings that come to us that are gut and rebuild versus just renovation, and we can look at doing that. Do you See remember? Move down to? For example, I mean, the A&M's MSC was a gut and rebuild. Uh -huh. Do you but remember what its cost per square foot was? Off the top of your head. Because <laughs> I gave you so much Just, notice. Yeah, off the top of my head, no, I don't. But we that's an example, but yes. a more comparable example to this project. Correct. And that's one of the reasons we went, did go ahead and, and recommend approval is because it, you know, we look at them individually and then we say, yes, they do have a valid reason for, you know, it's not just come in and build out shell space. They're doing a difference between a minor renovation and a major renovation. Well, uh, anyway, bottom line, recognizing that uh, we have 12 percent fewer staff doing probably 12 percent more projects uh, at the risk of overloading the boat, perhaps we could look into uh, and make some recommendations, uh, at least informally, in a to the to the institutions on uh, you know, what would result in better student participation. Doctor, uh, you know, public policy is made by those that show up. So uh, I'm not as troubled by the 6% as some of my esteemed colleagues are, as long as the process was adhered to. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to clarify that. Uh, was your student body governance uh, involved in the decision to move forward with that, and what was their role? Uh, were they the drivers of this? Did they take an active role in promoting this? Did they come to the administration saying, look, we need to fix a student union. It's, it's way too crowded. Can you give me a, a background on where your student governance was? Sure. The, the process was completely student-led uh, as, as a matter of uh, practice at, at the University of North Texas. The administration does not seek to influence or direct uh, referenda programs or the outcome of any of these projects. The student government uh, passed a resolution uh, after uh, lengthy debate of, uh, of the proposal. They considered different funding scenarios, different fee levels. Uh, a student committee, uh, the student union committee, held multiple information sessions uh, for a lengthy period of time before the vote was set, the referenda date was set. They tabled in the existing union. They en enlisted the help of fraternities and sororities. Uh, they uh, led a large student committee to design and shape what the union should have in it. Uh, so the process was uh, uh, almost completely student-led, and they made trade-offs about the size, the price, when the fee should go into effect, uh, and what kind of amenities they wanted in this, this facility. It was as aggressive as any uh, student effort I've seen as compared to, say, student government elections or rush for fraternities and sororities or spirit events around football games. This, uh, this consumed a significant amount of campus life for many months uh, before the final vote was taken and approved by the student government. And your student government, can you give us a breakdown of what that uh, election was? Was it overwhelmingly supportive of the final product, or was it a 54% majority? 
Uh, no, the student government voted overwhelmingly to support the project. It was unanimous. And, and uh, the election, was that promoted uh, through uh, various means as to the date and time of being able to elect? It was uh, uh, in all the existing uh, residence facilities and uh, and most of the public space of the student union on the website. Uh, there was a dedicated website to the project. There were uh, Facebook accounts sort of with the for or against that were student generated and student led. Uh, so th there was uh, a great amount of uh, promotion uh, through the student committee. To and was the, the election newspaper. held over a, a long enough period of time that people could uh, uh, get uh, get there and vote if they chose to? Yes, sir. It was held over a four-day period, uh, giving uh, all students, commuters as well, an ample opportunity uh, to involve themselves in the project. And have the results of the election been challenged by the minority? No, sir. Uh, I move to approve. Second. Further Mr. discussion? Chairman, yes, further discussion, please. And I understand you're in a hurry, but hear me out here. No, sir. Got all the time in the world. Thank you, sir. Yes, they are meeting the adhering to our process. Nobody questioning. Nobody's questioning the validity of the project itself. But they are finding loopholes. And we're sitting here and justifying, oh, yes, but they've met the process, so we got to let them go. And then on the other side, we're concerned about the cost of higher education. You can't have both. We keep, you know, who at the end of the day is going to pay for it? These students, their parents. 1,200 out of 36,000 students voted yes. 1216, 1,216 students. And we're allowing that voice to raise the tuition for the entire and their parents. I think we're not looking this. We're not here to say, okay, you met all your paperwork. You fill out all the forms correctly. Okay, you got it. We got to get catch a flight now. We got to go. That's not why you were here. We got to look at this thing and decide the purpose of us being here is to make sure that the cost of higher education especially in this day and age when we're being asked by the legislature to do more with the less and how it affects the students. And yes, these folks are, you know, I've seen how these campuses work, how the leadership of campuses are coded by the administrators. But if there was real effort on their part to get more, you know, at least 10 percent of the student body said, hey, yes, we want to do this thing. There's some legitimacy there. But I think we're just sitting here trying to be nice and polite and, you know, whatever is the protocol here, ask just good question that can give us good answers so we can approve it and move on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, uh, I want to add something also. Uh, we saw a presentation from UT out of 310 million, they are raising 1.105 million from donors. I see nothing coming from the gift and donors from the community. Uh, I think that's a big weakness. Also, they should look at the online component. Maybe with online component, they don't need to have this huge construction uh, where students will have to pay 200 percent more. And I think we should really look at uh, our commissioner should look at how can we have more participation. You know, was it online voting or how did they do it? Or was it convenient for the students to come and vote? I think uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, Munir and Dennis. I think uh, we are hosing the students by increasing their tuition fee, uh, the building fee from 51 $51 to 167 I think uh, we can could postpone. I, could we get some clarification? Um, of the $95 million, this was an engineering program, and I think it was tuition. Um, it was student, student financing. It was designated dollars. tuition for the 95, well, $78 million of the bonded of the 95 is going to be repaid by designated tuition. Out of the $310 million, is that what the total project cost was? Now, this is a project that they've had on their books and have been working on for That's two 25%. years, four years that I know of, two or three years that I know of. 
but um, okay and it but this is it's specifically an engineering based it is an engineering based um, engineering and research center versus the versus campus the building Union. is for all the students is that correct that's correct okay so, all right uh, I have additional comment the construction is not going to be begin till summer 2013 I think let's get them to see if they can uh, get more gift money more donation money or what else can they do rather than slapping students with a 200 percent increase in the tuition fee i don't know if we can do it uh commissioner will have to see if we can expect more participation more than six percent or fred you may have some answer but i don't think that uh, 2200 students should make 17 uh, 36 000 students eventually 45 000 students to increase the tuition fee by 200 percent this is not fair to students they are not fair, this is not fair to parents like yeah. Munir said that uh, we cannot let the cost of education go up I think we need to look at online component maybe 30 percent of this can be done online without having a big huge building I think Fred made a good point a few minutes ago and I would be interested to know what those student use fees are for other universities because if this was something that was built that long ago I think that information we say look we've now moved into an area that is competitive it's what other major universities have and I would feel much better about it I tend to agree with David I'm not happy with six percent vote but it sounds like in my mind that the university did everything that they could do to get people to participate they had a lot of involvement from leadership they made it available at the end of the day we this is a learning process for students and yes we all lament the fact that we didn't have you know more people do it but I, I do think it would be helpful to the group to know if that 51 going to 160 whatever it is well wow, now we're in a competitive range and also you know if I number one six percent participated but only three and a half percent approved it okay yes. number two when you compare these fees compare them to their peers university yes. do not compare that to the UT Austin campus because if everybody wants to build a Taj Mahal if UT you know I didn't have a problem with the last project because they can afford it they're only putting 25 percent on the backs of your students okay but you have to make sure here we're talking about 90 percent you got to compare them with their own peer universities you do not want them to build everybody otherwise you build this one I got to build a little bigger than you and that's what's happening right now all around look around one question real fast um what was the voting method I mean it was it online voting was a ballot box there, there were uh, multiple pathways for voting including online and in-person uh, ballots if if I'm understanding it Raymond you may need to clarify but I, I believe the referendum is by state statute and uh, there would need to be change a statute. change in statute uh, a, as it stands now so um, we could we could call up uh, Bill France to explain this in in, uh, in greater detail but my understanding is that state statute simply calls for a student referendum on this issue but does not stipulate what level of student participation there has to be for this for the referendum to be binding that is correct sir <clears throat> okay so one possible uh, solution manure for for the longer term and for all institutions would be uh, we can consider, we can discuss uh, the possibility of recommending a change to the statute to put in some threshold. Um, you know, that'll, you know, the legislature will, I'm sure, chew on that quite a bit and decide, you know, what is the right threshold. But that's that's one possibility. The other thing I've just visited with Susan about is, re you know, regardless of today's vote and the recommendation to the board, that between now and the board meeting, um, we'll the staff can kind of put the fee into context by uh, surveying peer institutions and finding out kind of you know what the lay of the land is so to speak on student fees uh, for this purpose and how the uh, both the old fee and then the, the new fee with the large increase would compare to those peer institutions so we'll try to get that distributed prior to the board meeting yeah so oh. as a process uh, assuming that this is approved uh, then it will go to the board in October is that correct and and uh, that's where the peer review can information will be available mm -hmm. yes 
We will do a quick survey, send it out. Um, they can give us and we can provide that information in the materials for the board meeting for the final vote on this. Very good. Is there any, yes, sir? Yeah, you know, Munir, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I tend to agree with you on this, uh, but it's hard to be an advocate for a disinterested victim. Uh, and, and I just understand that there's just apparently a tremendous amount of apathy or confidence in their student body leaders at UNT. Uh, let me ask a final question to put that fee increase in, in context. What does a bachelor's degree full-time student pay in tuition and fees at UNT per year? The, the in-state cost uh, is approximately $17,000. Okay, so we're talking about an extra $115 dollars in comparison to the 17,000 230 I'm sorry it's 115 per semester Master. so it'll be 230 okay so that's a per 230 okay thank you and if I could just clarify to some of the comments around fundraising nothing in the financing structure precludes uh, accepting gifts using gift money uh, encouraging uh, external support and and we fully intend to do that especially with the large bookstore vendors uh, and others who will participate there there are organizations uh, that may have interest in supporting the project I think in our preparation of the materials it it's just too challenging to make the project contingent on that uh, and so nothing about the financing arrangement precludes support of that nature and and we will seek it let me follow up on that, if I may. Will that mean you will reduce the fees that you already passed? The, the, stat, the, the referendum, as passed, sets no, no. the fee not to exceed. So it, it's up to the students. Uh, when, if, if a major gift materializes, uh, the student senate has the ability to say, okay, in light of this, you know, when the fee implements, it will be at a lower level. So who makes the final decision, Board of Regents or the student government? For these, for these referenda, uh, especially in this case, it is the students. And the Board of Regents is obligated to accept student? Uh, of, cor of course not. Okay. Um, and and, and they, you know, they, they approve the process. But compared to, say, the athletics fee that okay. we implemented several years ago, that had a different approval process uh, than this one. Forgive me, I forgot your name, sir. Andrew Harris. And Andrew, yes, uh, Mr. Harris, what is your position there? I'm the Vice President for Finance and Administration. Uh, uh, Mr. Harris, tell me the last time UNT roll back any tuition or any fees because of any circumstances, whether you got some funding from outside sources or, you know, whatever, windfall or whatever. Do you, can you recall during your tenure that happening? I've only been at the university since uh, late 2007, so the answer is no. Okay, thank you, sir. I'd like to make one brief statement, believe it or not. I, I, I want you guys to know that my comments are not directed to your institution or to any of you on a personal level. I mean, I personally think this is a good project. I just don't like the fact that we're, we're continually seeing, as an individual on this board, these pro not just your project, but from virtually every institution in the state coming forth, <laughs> putting more money and more expense on the back of students with little or no participation on the part of students. Now, I've been on the inside. I've sat on the inside behind the closed doors for six years. I know how this op operates. I know exactly how it's done. I've been there, and I'll, I'll hold my, the institution that I represented just as accountable as anybody else. But I personally, I will personally, as an individual member of this board, begin to scrutinize the participation, the level of participation on the part of students, and I will personally, as an individual member of this board, begin to hold this administration and the Board of Regents more accountable for more participation. I, I, I understand you've gone by the rules. I understand this, this, this is not directed just to you guys. I'm painting a real broad brush here to every institution that comes before this board that I personally will, will continually ask this same question every time it's brought forward. How much participation and what are you doing to get more students involved in the process of controlling the cost of higher education in the state of Texas? And, and again, you guys have a good project here. It's needed. It's obvious to me this is a very worthy project. I mean, it, your project, your, your facility is outdated. It needs to be upgraded. It's, it's directed towards student services. Y'all are doing a good thing, not a bad thing, a good thing. But I'm not happy with with this, this these low student participations, and and we do have a, a social obligation to society to to work harder. 
to get students to, you know, hand out the ballots in classroom. The professors can walk in and say, have you voted? Here's a ballot. That'd be the first thing I'd do. Unless they throw it in the trash can, then, then, then put it in front of them, each one of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have another question. Uh, uh, what percentage of the classes that you offer uh, at your campus are online? Have you looked at that? Or uh, approximately 10%, 5%, 20%? Because that may be a big factor in reducing building cost. I don't have a precise answer for you. We can provide it to you uh, after after this meeting. I will say that uh, the University of North Texas is one of the state's leaders in online delivery of online courses. Uh, it's a substantial uh, portion of our educational portfolio, and we're seeking to grow it. Thank you. Uh, if I may, um, you know, I'll tell you from personal experience in running those referendums <coughs> that even linking them to uh, student government elections are linking them to homecoming elections and heavily advertising them and doing all voting online and leaving it open for a week. Uh, you know, we did that and we still only got maybe six to seven percent. I think the only way that you're going to get the maximum number of students to participate is if you link it to uh, their scheduling. Whenever they're setting up their schedules, make them vote in order to complete the schedule. And I understand that's probably going to take you know legislative action or something to to get something like that implemented, but. Um, you know, I was one of the students that cared. You know, I was one of the students that voted. But no matter how much you push the marketing for that, there's a large number of students that, you know, no matter how accessible you make it to them, they just don't care enough to vote, even on athletic referendums and stuff that does raise their fees. So maybe creating a situation where they would have to vote on it in order to complete their schedule or buy their textbooks. I mean, I don't have any answers for that, but... Mr. Chairman, I think the Chairman Heldenfield hit on the nail when he said we need to come up or make recommendation to the legislature about the threshold. I promise you it will, be, it will do the trick. You know why it will do the trick? Our administrators will get it taken care of because they want that project. <coughs> they, will, they will find a way to get these students to come and vote. Mark my word. And there, there are new tools, and Ryan, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the, the uh, crowdsourcing tools that are, you know, a social networking way of creating a community dialogue and, and building consensus of opinion. Um, do you think that's something that would resonate with students or that would yield more participation, or do you think uh, they're just as good at, at ignoring electronic social media as they are at, at uh, the, coming to the ballot box? I think you would have slightly higher participation, but ultimately, you know, I mean, when we did it, we sent out emails. Uh, to the student accounts, and we knew that every student that registered at the university had a student account that they had to check, and there was still a 7% turnout because they would just kick it to their, to their trash. Um, I think the only way you're going to get a lot of students to vote it's or get the maximum participation is forcing them to do it as a, you know, because you'll set up your classes online. Yeah. At the end of that, before you can submit it, if you include a thing, hey, here's a referendum, and don't pre-mark one of the boxes. Make them actually choose yes or no. I mean, I think that's the only way you're really going to get 100% uh, participation on something like that. Uh, oh, Ryan, I, I learned in the Army that uh, positive reinforcement sometimes works, but negative reinforcement always works. <laughs> and, and I would only say that I think that we haven't considered the power of free food. <laughs> <laughs> that works or t-shirts or t-shirts for that matter t-shirts okay any Can any other, vote, mr chairman any helpful comments i'm ready <laughs> I, I just wanted to make sure that Manier is aware that my flight is at 6:45, so i got all the time <laughs> chairman mine is at two o'clock okay. <laughs> if only the parents could vote on these things right exactly okay law. Uh, if there's no further discussion um We'll, we'll vote on the, the, the item. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are you guys listening? <laughs> all those in favor, say aye. We got one aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Are you? Are you I'm opposed right now. Okay. You're the tiebreaker. <clears throat> well, I vote to approve. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Good luck with your project. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5B1 and 2, we're on the consent calendar. Item 5C is a report on facilities decisions of projects approved to meet the requirements of the expedited process for approval. 
there are any questions, I believe that's uh, are the, that, that's uh, in your packet, yeah. item 5C. Are, are the two first projects by A&M linked? Are those essentially on the same uh, live virus vaccine manufacturing? These, I, I don't understand therapeutics man retrofit. But I'm assuming man means manufacturing? Yes. That, these are actually in I, my understanding is that that one was um, part of their federal thing that they're retrofitting to get ready for the manufacturing that they just got the federal grant for. They're getting started on that process. And then uh, this is that live virus wing that they're doing. Right, right, so they, are, they are linked, but they've separated them out for the way they're they're doing their funding and that sort of thing. So they're separated out because they're fundraising mechanism? I believe so. Is someone here? Or one from the, one uh, is a res renovation of a current building that they're getting ready, and then the other one's new construction. Okay, so they're, they're renovating an existing facility, which will come under one set of rules, mm -hmm. and they're constructing a new facility, but they will be linked for this federal project. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Not, that is an information item only. We'll move to the next item on the agenda. Item 5D is to discuss the uh, discussion of staff recommendation relating to the requirements of the expedited, expedited process for approval. Susan Brown, Assistant Commissioner of the Planning and Accountability, and Tom Keaton, Director of Finance and Resource Planning, will provide information to the committee. Um, as as you remember, the committee had asked for us to come forward with some recommendations of um, different things that we could do because of the large volume of expedited approvals that were coming through. And so what we have done is um, Tom has looked at some of the different ways we could go about it. Some of them are statutory requirements and some of them are things that we could put into our rules. And so he's going to present some of those ideas that can go into the rules now. Uh, thank you. The, uh, we had talked about this briefly at an earlier meeting, but I, and I think after review and discussion with the executive staff, one of the ways that we can um, perhaps appropriately look at through the rules um, to influence the expedited projects, not so much to influence that, but I think it's just good business, is through the capital expenditure plan. Each year, institutions submit a capital expenditure plan during the summer, which covers the next five years. We produce that report, it's available online, and it is submitted to this to this group. Generally, as a, it's, it's pretty much just an approval item. Because it covers everything, $1 million and above. Um, that's because we link with other state agencies and leverage the same system. Their rules account for $1 million, where ours are four. So we're going to get a large list of projects. But within those projects, there may be a possibility to look at them at that point with a greater level of scrutiny to see if they actually meet. Right now, we don't make any assessment. We take in the data. We provide that in the report as a, as a reflection or a coordination of the capital expenditure plans for the institutions in the state of Texas. I think it's, it's important um, to look at it in terms of percentages. Um, some data we've looked at from the existing or from the capital or from the expedited projects that have come to date, 50 percent of the projects varied by over 10 percent of what the capital expenditure plan estimates were. Now, granted, they were estimates, but that's a variance of over 10 percent. 38 percent of the projects varied by over 20 percent. And 18 percent of the projects varied by over 50 percent. Now, that's an absolute variance, so it may be half of what they thought or, or twice what they thought. Um, the average variance was $12.2 million. So, granted, there is a, a level of estimation on one end, and then just the time order effect of going forward, the, the numbers get more refined. But I think if, if and, I, and I think we're in bounds in rule um, uh, 61.0572, statute Texas Education Code, because our responsibility is to ensure the efficient use of construction funds across the state and to an, advise and require the institutions to produce this capital expenditure plan. So essentially this is saying in order for it to be considered as 
truly on the capital expenditure plan, that there are some parameters that you have to meet. You have to be within a certain range. While we understand that five years out, that range can vary wildly. But when we get into that one year out, the plan should have refined to a given point. Now, whether that's 10 percent, whether it's 20 percent, I certainly um, you know, submit to you that there are, there are different ways to go about it. But I think that's our principal rule method that we can go forward with that's within the scope of our responsibility by statute without infringing on the provisions of the expedited process, which are, which are also in statute. Questions? Is that something that y'all would like us to pursue, looking at those master plans more carefully and, and doing some additional evaluation of those one year out program or projects that are coming to us? That would be part of that expedited approval process. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. This has far more implications on the expenses of, of higher education than the project we just spent almost 30 minutes debating. So I think we need to have great scrutiny on these projects. Okay. And especially, I, this came, you, you were requested to look into this out of concern. There was a huge uptick in requests that were under this expedited process as soon as we put it in play. And so the natural suspicion of board members is, well, when the cat's away, the mice do play. Correct. I mean, not an accusation. I'm just suspicious. And what we will do is what we, we will draft some rules for comment. We'll bring them to the December committee if we have time. Anyway, I will try to get them to the December committee for y'all to vote on so that we can start looking at those um, master plans that are due to us. When do they come in? They come in the in summer. The summer. So the ones we can start looking at the ones that we currently have now for those and we'll draft the rules that go forward. You know, <clears throat> Susan, we, we talked about using the, the new electronic mapping tool that we've got to, to try to help the board put both facilities and degree programs in better statewide context. Mm -hmm. And so anything we can do that helps this board kind of step back and look at the big picture across all the master plans and, you know, what the investment is and what, what okay. the overall source of the funding is. What Not might, just for a given project or a given institution, but and what we might do is look at the one, sorry, at the one year plans because they're going to have a lot more specificity on those than if you're looking five years out. Yeah, the plans are very soft, yeah. and so if we you know concentrate on those and then where appropriate maybe put in some of the other information. And uh, Tom, you mentioned an average reference, an average variance on actual project cost from plan cost is that what you were referring to yes earlier? sir what was that figure 12.2 million sir 12.2 million so as a percentage of average project budget what is that do you know what that average variance is percentage wise we didn't look at that because the variance in the type of projects and size that can that can be sure. rather and and there were there is one data point in there that we did exclude um, the there was one project that were was actually previously approved for four projects four independent projects, but realistically, they're all part of one. When you combine those together, just the way that the database spit it out. But we're confident that the, the variance of 12.2 of, of million is mm -hmm. very accurate. And looking, it, it would be a substantial percentage variance, given I mean, the if number. If you just do the math on 67 projects expedited at 3.3 billion, you can, you can figure out what that variance is. It's a, it, that variance is looks like it may be between 20 and 25 percent. It's it's relatively large, sir. And, you know, as we scrutinize uh, this hold thing. On, Manier. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I wonder if a smaller group of us with greater expertise in these areas uh, may, as part of our governance uh, under your discretion, be available to the staff to really drill down on some of these projects in greater detail and then provide input to, to the committee on this. Just a thought. We've, we've done something similar a few years ago with two members of this committee serving as a task force to look at. In fact, uh, one of the things that task force did was, was to help streamline our own internal process uh, uh, in a way we thought was pretty balanced before the advent of SB5. Uh, but it also hardened our, we had a few uh, guidelines and we said, what's the point of having standards and guidelines? Either you got standards or you don't. 
and so that task force also said these will be the standards uh, and came up with the new well with Tom's research and work came up with uh, adopting the new space utilization efficiency deal so there's a there's a precedent for that and uh, I will take it under advisement with uh, chairman Hahn here um, under the be careful what you ask for rule <laughs> yeah. of, uh, task force <laughs> assignment <laughs> as you scrutinize these things we also got to keep in mind you know we can't have one rule for all size institutions mm -hmm. uh, you know you got certain institution with certain amount of budget and number of students versus some smaller so those threshold has to reflect the size and their budgets and whatnot otherwise all day long I mean then again we are creating loopholes for smaller to get by with it and, and if we look at the one year and we look at say their top five projects in that first year or something like that we could you know we would be looking at all their one-year projects for each institution and but the percentage threshold would be a percentage not actual numbers probably any other questions or comments okay so so you will be looking at that and bringing rules forward okay very good if there's no other questions uh, we'll move to the next items uh, 5 E and F were on the consent calendar item 5 G is consideration of adopting the Commissioner's recommendation to the committee relating to the approval of the TSTC study Rider 42 General Appropriations Act 82nd Texas Legislature regular session Susan Brown, Assistant Commissioner of Planning and Accountability, is available for questions. Susan. Okay. Um, the entire report is actually in the white pages that you received. Um, TSTC in the 82nd, uh, 81st session. I'm losing track of which session we're in. The session before, 81st session, I believe, um, we were asked to work with the Comptroller's Office to do, to see if it was feasible to do this type of a funding mechanism for TSTC. We found that we um, it was feasible. The um, This session, they asked us to come up with a methodology. We've been working with TSTC, TWC, um, with consultation from the Comptroller's <coughs> Office. Uh, for most of a year now, meeting with them at least on a monthly basis to talk about how we could do it and different information that we had, taking into account some of the recommendations from the prior report that we did to streamline the process. Uh, we found that we could do it. We have a model in place that everybody agrees with, um, TSTC, and um, so this is something that actually kind of rolls into the next discussion but we found that we could do it and so we are um, we have this report that will be going to the legislature which talks about the methodology and matching the students to the workforce so if there's and and it is it basically takes outcomes to almost a whole new level because it ties it to their workforce and how much um, the students that leave TSTC are earning over a five-year period and so that's how we you know it, it is the ultimate outcomes based model it takes outcomes to its logical to conclusion the, to, yes fulfilling the workforce needs mm -hmm. the trick is is in accurately measuring the value add it is and um, we did do some things that simplified it from the last one um, the comptroller's office had had looked at the value add going um, out for a lifetime earnings and, and all this obviously we fund on a biennial basis that's not a realistic way so what we have done is looked at what the students are earning compared to minimum wage because students when they enter TSTC must have at least a high school diploma or equivalent and so um, we we just compared it to a base minimum wage and we only did it for a five-year period looking out five years because there's so many people that go in they get trained then they get retrained and retrained we thought five years was a reasonable TSTC agreed with that uh, TWC agreed with it we also aggregated at a much higher level so we looked at it by associate degrees certificates transfer students leavers that sort of thing instead of trying to get down to the discipline specific that the comptroller's office had done uh, we did that because even 
What really matters is how much the student is earning. Um, we do not have data from TWC that says what their occupation is anyway. So if you're an accountant and you're working <coughs> in a hotel, you show up as hotel employee. You don't show up as an accountant. So it's you run into those kind of issues. The data is not there. Um, TWC had um, looked at um, whether they would be able to collect that type of information. The cost to business was too great, and the, uh, so they are not going to be asking for that information. So that's one of the reasons for aggregating at a higher level also. Uh, Susan, if I'm understanding what you're saying here in the uh, material, everyone worked together and was in Every, agreement with yes. this? Yes, 100% okay. agreement. We worked with um, very closely with TSTC. Yes, sir. Yeah, I am concerned about the potential for bias in your survey uh, by not being specific to occupations that require the degree that they actually received. Mm -hmm. You may have successful students who could have succeeded in those tasks at a higher wage level directly out of high school just because of aptitude and, and their uh, other experiences. I think attributing it only to the degree, unless you're being specific to the job, uh, may not really be reflective of the real value or lack of value that the degree actually gave them in earning that, uh, that additional revenue. I agree. Um, there, we don't do a survey. We actually match the students with the UI wage record. Right. It is a one-to-one -one match with the UI wage record. So we're getting their actual salaries, quarterly salary, salaries and summing them up. Um, because there is not going to be a way of getting um, actual occupation through that, we do not have a way of tying those two together at all. Um, doing surveys, most of the time the surveys, because we have done student follow-up surveys, um, the 6% response rate is actually <laughs> about, about the thing, you know, so it gets back to do you use actual numbers or do you try to tie it with a self-reported survey type thing and, and we opted to go with the actual numbers that we have. Yeah, and I misspoke. I understand you're not doing a survey, but well, I guess what I'm getting to the point as is the, the student who is successful in our higher education system generally has a higher aptitude and a higher degree of persistence. Uh, they're, they're smarter and they're more willing to get after it and, and complete it. Those are the kind of people people want to employ and they're generally successful in whatever endeavor that they are under. And I'm, I'm concerned that we somehow say higher education results in this, when in fact the raw material would have resulted in that without the higher education. And that, that is, that's true. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to pull that out of the methodology either. I think we have to have uh, occupation-specific data. I think that we're going to have to go back to the people that are collecting the data and say, we really need that data, and we really need to know, was that degree essential to get that job? Okay, that's TWC, and they would have to collect it for all industry. I, I understand it's a huge so, undertaking. And, and it would take legislative changes at that point. Right. And um, they had an estimate. We did a hearing on this uh, last week, and they and TWC estimated. I can't remember if it was ten, ten billion, ten, ten million dollars minimum to start collecting that. And that was the state cost to collect it. That did not include the employer cost of collecting that information. There are a number of factors. I mean, you've hit on some that that can be problematic. And and for example. There are many students who uh, go into a different field than their degree is in, but they may not have hired them if not for that degree. For example, I know of one person who went into marketing who had a, was an honor student in electrical engineering, but the electrical en they wanted somebody in marketing with electrical engineering. So it's hard to do the one-to-one the -one match. If you look five, ten years down the road, sometimes people are going into something different. So using engineering again, you frequently see an engineer who then becomes a manager. And they don't, they wouldn't be identified any longer as, as an engineer. But these personal factors you're talking about definitely weigh in. You also have factors related to where they're willing to move, 
Are they able to move? What's the local economy? Are they tied in to say if, if they – are they a local resident of Waco? Do they, f for some reason, need to stay in Waco rather than take a higher-paying job in, in another area? Uh, there are a lot of these factors that, that weigh in. And uh, I think this is sort of our, our first push into this, and I think we can get better at this as we go forward. Uh, those of you who have participated in the council heard Andrew Carnavale talk about some of the limitations with uh, wage record data nationally. This isn't just an issue in Texas in terms of what's collected, but there, I think we're going to get better at this. And just to let you know, I've asked Susan outside of this concept to, to follow up on, on uh, what happens to our graduates. You know, immediately when they graduate from high school and their wages and what's happening five years later and, and ten years later to, to, and by field. So we're going to get outside of this project some additional information for you that might serve later on to, to help improve this process. So uh, it's a current issue in terms of employment after education. So we, we've sort of independently on our own decided to pursue some additional studies to get more answers for you in the future and, and try to get better at this. Any other comments or questions? Move approval. Any further discussion? None. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item 5H is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee relating to formula funding amounts for public institutions. Susan Brown, Assistant Commissioner, Planning and Accountability, is available for questions. Make sure. it clear as mud to us, Susan. That's about how clear it will be. Um, obviously, y'all adopted some recommendations in April for formula funding. Um, you did not adopt dollar values for the general academic institutions and for the health-related institutions because we wanted to get a little bit better feel or try to get a little bit better feel for how the revenue stream was coming in the state, that sort of thing. Also in July, you then heard from the Texas Association of Community Colleges on a different recommendation for the community colleges that had come forward from the formula committee. So I'm going to go over some of the differences and some of the changes that we would like to make and, some, and make those recommendations again. So next slide. And this is just a quick slide to show, you know, to remind you, you know, we make recommendations, goes to the LBB, the um, total amount that actually gets um, distributed for each sector is obviously dependent on the legislature making those decisions. So that's sort of thing. And we're going to start with, go ahead, next slide. The community colleges, this was the recommendation that was made for the community and technical colleges um, back in April. I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, next slide. This is the, the breakout by sector. So the community colleges, the Lamar State Colleges, and the Texas State Technical Colleges. At this point, what I'm going to do is one of our recommendations is for the Texas State Technical Colleges, we just had the discussion about the new methodology, is to separate them and have them funded through the return value. And so that is one of the recommendations. Is that, And they're aware of this. They're in agreement with it. Um, so that is one of the recommendations. Okay. Next slide. Um, this is the, just a quick arrow of the process that we use to go through um, for the TSTCs, the model we just talked about. I just, in case this got separated out from the other one, I wanted to make sure we had a little bit about that in here. Next slide. Here is the recommendation for the community colleges only. In the coordinating board, what was adopted in April and what um, TAC has since brought forward. As you can see, it is actually less than what was originally adopted by the coordinating board. Um, we had a discussion with um, TAC yesterday, Linda did, and basically they have changed how they want to calculate. They understand that we're in very tight fiscal times right now. They wanted to put forward something to the legislature with the understanding that, you know, to let the legislature know that 
they understand the difficult times that we're going through right now as a state and they would like to make up some of the growth in the future. This gets them back to a third of the growth from the 10 and 11 biennium. And um, she talked to them again last night and um, they were, would really like if the coordinating board endorsed their recommendation, which is actually at a lower rate. So. Um, that is, that is tax request. Obviously, for your total recommendation, we would need to add, add in the Lamar State Colleges to the total dollar amount, which would bring it up to um, just a little bit over $2 billion from the 1.9 total recommendation because we have to add the Lamars. They don't. There are some other um, things they came up with, slightly different momentum points, and I'll be going over those next. So next slide. Um, basically, they um, requested, which was something the formula committee requested, that we add a metric for um, adult basic ed and for ESL. However, uh, they do understand that we don't have the data. We're not opposed to doing that. We just don't have data on ABE and ESL at this time that's a reliable, consistent source of data. So that was one thing. Um, TAC also does not include first college level English in their metrics, and that's something that we will be talking to them. I think at the time they did it, we didn't have the right data. We do have it now. And so our recommendation was under that assumption that we would include that. The other could, could that have just been omitted? I think it was probably just omitted on their, okay. on their side. And so we'll talk to them. I can't. In all of our discussions, they've never pointed that out. They, we pointed, we saw it and put it on the slide, but I don't believe that that's really a big issue. Also, they would like for STEM, those critical fields, to get a, instead of two points, any credentials in the critical fields, instead of two points, to get a 2.25. Again, we don't have a problem with that at all. So those are really the big difference on the momentum points. Um, if you'll go back to the prior slide. One thing I did forget to mention is that instead of the $6 million for small institution supplement, they would like a separate formula that basically gives each district a million dollars as a base formula amount. This is actually to help the smaller districts as the more urban areas grow rapidly the smaller districts, the amount of funding that's going to the smaller districts is getting less and less of the total pie. They want to make sure that those small institutions have a base level of funding in which to operate. And we're fine with that. And this is basically cover administrative expenses and that sort of right. thing. Right. There's Where, just certain basic Whether it's a small institution or large. You have certain, you need student affairs, you need libraries, you need in that sort of thing. And so that's really to cover that sort of thing. The large districts will get no more than the small district. They thought they could find a way to make up from, from it from other places. So it's, it's really a, a very good proposal, we think. Okay. So you mentioned that you were talking to them. Uh, th there's 50 institutions here. We were talking to TAC. So TAC. Uh, do they have buy-in? I mean, is they do. They, their membership actually voted 100% on this recommendation. Okay. So uh, this recommendation is $39 million less than what we previously had adopted yes. for the community colleges. Yes. But you mentioned somehow you'd have to, the state colleges at Lamar, you'd have to add back in? We would have to add in. And I'm talking about what we had, that what the board had adopted for the community colleges. Right. We would have to add back in the Lamar, because we're TSTC, we're recommending that they get funded under the return value model. For Lamar State Colleges, it would add $45 million. 40, the $45.8 million would be added in, so it's actually an increase. It's, it, it's well, not a it's, decrease. A, it, it's still an increase, but it's not an increase over what we had recommended for the Lamars and community colleges together. The community college portion of that is actually less than what we had recommended. The community college portion is less? Is, is less than what we had recommended by 232. Or no, that's the 230. I'm reading it's 39 million less, but you've taken out Lamar, which is 45.8 more. So I think 
the way, I, and I'm I'm confused. If you can explain it to me, what it looks like is less is actually more. Okay, you're talking about the community the colleges. You have one point nine six nine billion. Right for the, for community, the community colleges. colleges. But that's taking out Lamar. No, oh, that is that is just community colleges. That is the TAC recommendation for only the community colleges. Okay, so it truly is thirty nine million dollars less overall. Yes. Well, it was actually what the coordinating board had re originally recommended for the community colleges was two point two, two hundred thirty nine. Based on the numbers that are on that pink slide, it, yeah, two point two oh eight billion. Right. Was the previous, and, and now right. in lining up with TAC on the community college component only, it's 1.969. So it's $39 million less. 239. 239. Correct. I, I stand corrected. Okay. <laughs> so what, what was driving them to ask for a lower number? Um, Reality. They, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We've already approved the higher number. I mean, I'm, I'm just. I'm they, appreciative of that, but I don't understand. The, uh, the, the, the TAC number came in after we had uh, uh, brought our recommendation to the uh, board. Uh, TAC did some further analysis, and they also took a look at political realities, and they wanted to uh, demonstrate uh, that they're cognizant of a tough budgetary environment. They came in with this number. I, I, I applaud them for this number and showing leadership and fiscal restraint. I, I do too. I just was looking for motivation. Political reality. And on the metrics uh, that we don't have with ABE and ESL, are we mm -hmm. proposing adopting their recommendation to add those in, even though we don't have As, metrics? No. What we were, what we have agreed to is that we will be looking for metrics that everybody can agree upon. Right now, they don't have, they don't even know of any metrics. <laughs> Okay. Right so now, we're so not we're, changing our plan. We're looking for metrics, and we are going to look, look for metrics, and we will bring that. Hopefully, we could find something before the next session and be able to add that to it. But right now, we don't have it, and they understand that. So, um, one of the other recommendations that TAC made actually deals with. Um, you can go to the next page. Actually, deals with the general academic. Next slide. Um, general academic outcomes-based formula model. We have told them, and they understand that it is really not something that we can make a change to the general academic outcomes-based model without talking to the formula committee since we've already adopted. And they understand that. This was something that they come up with, and they are actually in the process of talking to some of the general academic institutions themselves about waiting for students to get an associate degree before they transfer. They wanted the general academics to get a little extra bump in their outcomes-based model. Um, that's something we would look at, but we would want input, obviously, from the general academic formula committee before we made changes to their metrics, since we are all in agreement at this point. We don't want to go in and make changes to what everybody has agreed to. Okay, Susan, so let me see if I... If I understand it, then then based uh, on, on the differences, mm -hmm. then we're uh, from a staff perspective, we're willing to uh, collect the data as far as the first item, as far as uh, ABE and ESL. As soon as we can find and good data and add that to it. Okay, but uh, in reality, that probably will take some time. So. Uh, we're going to notate that we will do that, but it's not correct. Okay, as far as the uh, uh, first college level English, we do want that included. We do want that included. Okay. We will talk to TAC. I don't believe that will be any type of issue. I think it was an oversight on their part, thinking that we didn't have that originally. Okay, and then as far as the credentials awarded, if I understand it, staff did not have a problem with. No, two, we don't have a, a problem with that at all. Two. We don't have a okay. problem with that at all. They also, one of the other things is they would also like for this, um, the metrics to be run on a rolling three-year average instead of the volatility that you get from a one-year change, that sort of thing. So, and we're fine. That would just smooth out the funding and make it a little bit more consistent. And we're so a rolling three-year average. Rolling three-year average, and we're fine with that also. Um, they would like us to also look at um, 
instead of institutions being compared to other institutions to have their outcomes funding to where they compare against themselves. Um, we have had a few discussions about different methodologies. There's nothing that we've agreed upon on that. They're fine with the original one being the three-year rolling average. And then we will continue discussions with them about how to do that in a way that still keeps the incentive for the institutions in place. Okay. Uh, so that's the community college that portion. It is the community college okay. portion. Uh, members, are there any particular questions from the community college standpoint? And they are, I will say they are also seeking and they have asked us to be supportive in this but not make a nearly, not make a recommendation and it's not something that we really have any control over. They would like to get back to their prior level of funding for their health and um, retirement plans. But okay. that is not something that the board has any control over. But it, it was a big hit for the community colleges and they are moving forward with that. All right. We told them we would make sure. So if there's move. no questions from the community college standpoint, do you want to move to the university? Okay. Next slide. Okay, this is a reminder of what was adopted in April, and these are the metrics for the outcomes-based funding for the universities. Okay, next slide. Um, this slide actually. Susan, I, I'm sorry. Could you just could you just run through those kind okay, of quickly? Okay, sure. Um, the first one is total undergraduate degrees. We're looking. Uh, closing the gaps concentrates a great deal on the undergraduate degrees, so this is bachelor's degrees. Um, we have a few institutions that award associate degrees, maybe a hundred a year total, So, but those would be included. Uh, degree productivity, this is for those institutions that take in a lot of transfer students, and it's the number of degrees per, bachelor's degrees per hundred full-time equivalent students. So that's, that actually, if you're getting transfer students in, your total FTSE is smaller. And it's so it actually does help towards getting in more transfer students. Uh, critical workforce needs, that's something we've already talked about and have had in our um, proposals for quite some time. Uh, time to degree, this is getting at. Uh, excuse me, that's a STEM fields. STEM fields. Uh, okay. STEM and nursing, allied health, teachers. Okay. Those, those areas that are critical to the workforce. We are actually also in the process of going out. These were, critical fields were adopted in 2000 for closing the gaps. We're in the process of working with TWC to go out and update those. And, and STEM fields does not include all the STEM fields. For example, it does not include biological sciences because there isn't a shortage in that area. So I just want to clarify okay. that. Yeah. Um, time to degree, um, this looks at the institution's six-year graduation rate, um, so that if you're graduating more of your students in a timely manner, it helps. Uh, cost to degree, this is the acknowledgement from the committee that some degrees cost more than others. And so as it's not so much at the current level, recommended level of 10% towards outcomes-based funding, they were kind of uh, worried that as that percentage that goes to outcomes-based funding might grow to 25% or more, um, that that difference would get lost. And so that is applying those matrix weights that we get to the different degrees to account for, you know, if you have a engineering degree the cost is actually much higher than if you have a liberal arts degree. And so that t is a recognition of that. Um, and the at-risk students, and this is to give awards, um, degrees that are awarded to at-risk students, and there's, you know, Pell Grant recipients, low SAT score, those students that are at the highest risk of dropping out, usually an institution has to put more effort into keeping them and mentoring them and that sort of thing, and that's to acknowledge that and to make, make them not want to say, okay, we're going to raise our standards and knock those students out. We don't, we don't want that to happen, and so that's that. Have we developed objective criteria? Yes, we have a, a criteria that match um, the federal government's criteria for at risk. 
and it's all information that we can collect on the students. Like if you get a GED, you're less likely to graduate instead of having a regular high school diploma. If you enroll part-time versus full-time, you're less likely to enroll. So those are criteria that are met at the time they enroll in the higher education institution. Right. right. Um, and then persistence. So they've comp that is similar to uh, momentum points. That is, as the student completes 30 hours or 60 hours or 90 hours on their way toward a degree, they, they get uh, points for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, this is the funding level as recommended by the Formula <coughs> Advisory Committee. Um, I will say that the, the INO funding rate, which is the instruction and operations funding rate of 57.5 is the um, dollar value that is applied to the weighted semester credit hours. Um, we developed that by looking at what had been previously recommended, taking a 15 percent um, efficiency, so expecting them to become more efficient in the process and applied the rate that time. Um, Part of this increase is also there's a 3% increase in semester credit hours being generated. Institutions are growing, given everything that's going on. The infrastructure formula actually is a 22% increase, which is very high. Um, electric rates are going up, maintenance, all of that falls into that infrastructure amount of increase. And that's um, over two biennia, the increase of 22%. And um, then the split is just how much of that amount gets um, given to them, given to the institutions for appropriated for either maintenance and operations or utilities. Obviously, it comes into the institutions as a lump sum. They spend it however is needed for maintenance and operations. They usually have to fill in from other sources also. And we're recommending no change in the small institution supplement. This is um, overall. Back. This is a, overall. This is a 12% increase for the um, universities. Are there any questions about that? As far as the uh, formula advisory committee, mm -hmm. uh, how is that made up? It is made up of representatives from different institutions all around the state. We have some large. We had representatives from. UT, from A&M, um, there was a representative from UNT, uh, Midwestern was on there, um, just all around the state. We looked geographically, so wide, very wide. Small institutions, large. All and large. And we, we, get, we grab from everybody, a proportion of everybody um, to and sit were, on that committee to get the input. Were they pretty much unanimous as far as this is they concerned? They were unanimous in, in, in this recommendation and with the outcomes-based funding, which was, um, they did a lot of work this time <laughs> to get to that point. And we really, you know, it's, um, it will be very nice if we could go forward with a, everybody is in agreement. It, it gives a stronger position to the legislature if we're all in agreement moving forward that this is really needed. And so that's okay. the staff recommendation. Uh, I had a quick question, uh, just for clarification. On, I guess it's the third slide from the end, uh, with the out the metrics on it. Mm -hmm. uh, for total undergraduate degrees, uh, is that a percentage or is that a straight number? It's a straight number. Okay. And these will, again, these will be done over a three-year rolling average. Okay. I was just curious. Thank you. And then we will go on to the health-related institutions. Um, health-related institutions, we're not requesting any kind of a change in the methodology or the relative weights. Um, obviously, health-related institutions are in a very different place. Usually when a student starts, their, their graduation rates would be closer to the 90-something percent. They, they move through as a cohort. They move through very well in general. So that's not an issue. Um, they recommended an increase of 12.4 percent. About uh, five and a half percent of that is due to the growth that they have had. They've had a lot of growth in their health professions and nursing programs 
So that is part of that growth. And the other part is um, to get back towards um, a higher level of funding. Um, part of that is for research. They're asking for a 6% increase in their <coughs> GME. Now, that is separate. That is the formula GME, GME, which is separate from the GME that is being recommended in our um, special item appropriations for the coordinating board. So there's actually two different pots of GME money. And so this is the formula GME, which is based on a headcount of um, medical students. Um, they would like a 7% increase in their uh, research enhancement. Um, that is one of the areas where you do see the biggest return on investment is research dollars in general. So that's what they're asking for. A 9% increase in their infrastructure. Again, they've had the same increases as, as everybody else. So, are there any other questions for the health related? Susan, <clears throat> didn't the, um, wasn't this number somehow related to the previously existing formula funding rates from uh, 01, 02 or prior to the 03 session? What they hit, what the health related institutions have said for, for by any of that I know of now, is that they would like to get back to the rates that were in place when um, they first became a formula driven. They used to all go and lobby. Well, they didn't lobby because they're not allowed to lobby, but they went and talked to legislators. They provided information. That's it. They provided the information to the legislature on how much funding they needed. Um, so in 2000, 2001, is, or 2001, they went under the formula system. And so since that time, the rates, because of growth, the rates that they have gotten have decreased, especially since 0405, they have been decreasing. Um, last biennium, the recommendation was to get a third of the way back. This time, this recommendation is to get about a quarter of the way back to what they had. And so. That's where they're trying to get back to. If I understand it, this is also based on the existing programs. It is based on the existing programs. Obviously, there is the recommend. UT is trying to start a medical school in Austin. Um, they have said that they will not be requesting any funding for the 1415 biennium for the Austin Medical School. They are requesting um, special item funding for the medical school in the valley. So that does not weigh into this. Also, it does um, not take into account what is going to happen, if anything, with the merger of the A&M Health Science Center into the A&M main campus. All of that is yet to be decided on how that is going to. So, so basically, we're, we're looking at this is the status quo. As where it is now, not where it may potentially because be in the future. What happens in the future is anybody's guess. We have to go forward with the information we have on hand now. Okay. So. Questions? Move approval. Okay. Any further discussion? If none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Susan, thank you very much. That's very difficult, and you did a good job. <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> Agenda item 5I is on the consent calendar. Um, I believe 5J is an update on the coordinating board's priorities for the 83rd legislative session. Uh, Linda Battles, Associate Commissioner, and Dominic Chavis. Senior Director of External Relations will provide information to the committee. Good morning, good morning, members. Uh, you should have at your places this booklet here, and it's the board retreat materials. As you know, we're going to have your retreat next week, so we don't want to spend a whole lot of time today on going over the specific legislative recommendations. But we do want to talk to you about how we arrived at these. And I particularly want to emphasize um, the stakeholder engagement that we have had over the sev last several months. 
um, to arrive at these recommendations. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dominic, who's going to walk you through this booklet uh, to give you an idea of how we've laid out the recommendations. And we will ask that you please uh, review that before next Wednesday. And uh, also wanted to give a very brief overview of the timeline. So we'll, we'll have your legislative retreat next Wednesday. Uh, we've uploaded these recommendations to our website to give the general public an opportunity to review them. And we'll encourage uh, public testimony, either oral testimony or written testimony at the October 25th board meeting uh, before you take up the final consideration for these uh, legislative recommendations. Pre-filing for legislation begins November uh, 6th. So we'll start monitoring and we'll start, uh, once you've approved your recommendations, identifying potential uh, authors uh, for filing. And then uh, the first day of session is uh, January 8th. So that's sort of the, the timeline. But I want to emphasize the stakeholder outreach and if I can, if you can indulge me, because of uh, Sunset Commission's recommendations, we're very, very sensitive uh, to getting that stakeholder input. So, just some some few examples of of what we've done over the last year to to engage our stakeholders. We've had uh, several financial aid briefings where we've invited financial aid officers, uh, legislative offices, uh, so forth. We've consulted with national experts. Um, to get their feedback on the direction that we're going with these recommendations. We um, consulted with several of our existing advisory committees on a number of issues, our formula funding advisory committee, uh, developmental education advisory committee, or obviously our financial aid advisory committee. We have a community college advisory group that meets quarterly that we've consulted with, and the undergraduate education advisory and the uh, Academic Course Guide Manual Advisory Committee. We've had uh, several legislative aides briefings, and the commissioner and the chairman have met with uh, several key legislators, as well as uh, keeping the governor's office informed. Um, we've had five regional meetings across the state uh, since May with higher ed faculty and administrators, business and community leaders. We've met in Tyler, Lubbock, Corpus Christi, El Paso, and Dallas. And we have three more left for this year. We're going to be going to San Antonio, Houston, and Austin over the next uh, several weeks. Since last December, the chairman and the commissioner have been making presentations to the university boards of regents at their meetings and have talked about some of these ideas. We've had staff made, make presentations at several conference, conferences, statewide conferences across the state. And we've also had um, quarterly media briefings to keep the media informed of what we're, what we're looking at. So those are just some of the examples. Um, we, we also um, worked with the Enrollment Services Efficiency Committee of the Council of Public University Presidents and Chancellors. So a long list of uh, stakeholder engagements. And um, again, uh, we'll encourage people to go to our website. It's available on our main web page under Issues of Current Interest. And you can link into those recommendations and our procedures for signing up for testimony are available on our website as well. Um, we do have a requirement that people sign up 24 hours prior to the meeting. So we have notice of who will be coming. So I'm going to turn it over to Dominic, who's going to go over the, the layout of the recommendations. Good morning, members. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about how we arrived at the recommendations that are in your book that we're going to discuss in some detail next week. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the packet so I can walk you through. So when you start to dive into this information, you know how we arranged it. Um, first, let me let me say that that the process for talking about legislative recommendations uh, for this session, uh, I don't think I'm making this up. Literally started the last day of session, last uh, last go around, where uh, I believe the commissioner and and staff sat in the cafeteria on on sine die and started identifying what some of the key priorities and and strategies we wanted to look look forward to and really started stressing to staff at all levels to start thinking about how we 
address those key strategies and priorities under the uh, goals that we've set for this for the agency. Um, in terms of the major priorities, uh, obviously outcomes-based funding, which you just heard a briefing of, not only were we we looking at that last session, but we actually had a legislative mandate under House Bill 9, which passed, which directed the core name board to work with institutions to develop the recommendations that you just uh, went through. So that was something that uh, was a little different this time, and, and we began that work, uh, as I said, very shortly after session ended through the advisory process uh, for formula funding. Uh, the, the commissioner also identified financial aid as a uh, significant area that we wanted to focus on, uh, recognizing that when we closed last session, we were looking at a reduction in the Texas grant program of about 10 percent, the first time we'd seen an actual reduction in funding for that financial aid uh, program itself. And, and so the commissioner directed staff that we've got to start to look at ways to stretch our limited dollars as far as we can to serve the growing number of students that are coming through the pipeline that are going to be financially needy so that we can continue to make progress and accelerate progress on, on participation and ultimately student success. Um, and, and then finally, one area that we, we looked at a major priority was uh, improving time to degree and credits to degree. Uh, you may recall that the board, as part of its cost efficiency recommendations uh, in the fall of 2010, had identified uh, this area as one area that we could truly improve uh, cost efficiency, not just in terms of the state by reducing the amount of time students spend in college, but also the credits they accumulate, but also it would reduce the, the outlays uh, financially that students and parents make uh, as, as they make their way through the higher education pipeline. And so all those three major priorities fell under our Tier 1 recommendations, which you will see if you look at your, uh, your packet here, we have a tab called Tier 1, and, and those recommendations that address those key strategy areas are laid out uh, in that uh, particular section of, of the book. And so you'll see the outcomes-based funding, you will see some recommendations related to financial aid, as well as uh, improving time to degree and credits to degree. In addition to those major priorities, what we do every interim is we, we ad adopt a process really from the ground up, uh, engaging staff at all levels, particularly staff at the programmatic levels, to help identify uh, areas that we can either improve agency cost efficiency, improve agency operations, improve programs that we administer, not only in, in areas that our staff see uh, that we can improve, but also they are, are closest to our stakeholders in many regards. And so they hear feedback on how our programs are being administered and, and they get feedback on an improvements that should be made to those programs. So as part of that process, uh, throughout the session, we encourage our staff to start thinking about changes they think need to happen. And we formally started soliciting those recommendations uh, from, the, from the agency staff uh, beginning uh, in March of this year uh, in preparation for uh, the, the decision document that you have in front of you. Um, that process, again, starts from staff at, at the programmatic level, it worked its way up through the assistant commissioners who, have a, a, who weigh in on, on which recommendations should be brought forward. Uh, we met with senior staff, the commissioner, and the deputies to, to vet those recommendations. And finally, those are what you will see laid out before you as both Tier 2 and Tier 3 recommendations under those uh, tabs you see in the, in the book in front of you. And so in, in, a, in a nutshell, this is a, a, a long process that we literally started when the session ended last time. Um, and, and we're now at the point where the board gets a chance to, to weigh in um, to not only decide whether or not there's additional recommendations that need to be made, um, we could also look at whether certain things need to move in the tier structure, uh, but that's something the board will discuss at the retreat and ultimately vote on in the October board meeting. Um, and, and as Linda mentioned, we have placed this document online. I do want to stress that again for our stakeholders who are listening in. They can uh, download this off our main homepage so they can start reviewing these as well um, and, and certainly provide feedback. Uh, finally, before I close and, and open it up to any questions, I do want to recognize um, uh, Lizette Montiel and John Wyatt with External Relations. John is already knee-deep in the appropriations process uh, as there are hearings going on right now at the Capitol. Uh, Lizette is somewhere in the audience behind me, but they've worked uh, very hard to get us to this point, and there's a lot more hard work ahead, as this is really the starting point for the legislative process as we move forward. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. 
Members, any questions, comments? Can you identify your staff in the audience? Was that? Way back there, hiding. And John's not here? John's down at the Capitol in hearings. Well, we certainly want to commend you and your effort and your work. Uh, I, I do know that it's been a year uh, and a pretty busy year at that. So uh, excellent job. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I, I would like to say to members of the board that uh, uh, I obviously spent a lot of time in the Capitol and, and I hear regularly that, uh, <clears throat> that we have the best uh, external relations staff of any uh, state agency and that uh, Linda, Dominic, Lizette, John, and other people who work with them do an outstanding job representing the coordinating board. I hear that frequently. But we don't have any more money, so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, if there's no other questions, thank you very much for the update. Then do you have this in the PDF? Actually, yes, and I'm about to email that to you shortly. Uh, Linda, <clears throat> would you also, uh, we've got a one-pager that, that you worked up a few days ago. It's um, actually in here. Uh, if you, oh, the LAR is the other. No, the, uh, it's right after financial aid tab, and you'll see tier one, one-pager. Oh, okay. There you go. So there's the whole book in a page. <laughs> Not really the whole book, but yeah, the top two. <laughs> yes. That's kind of what that one page uh, of the is. of the tier one recommendations. Correct. Uh, those are the excuse me the recommendations that we think are the highest profile, biggest impact, um, probably highest pro priority for the board. Uh, going into next session. So if we can get anything done, having any of those move forward, I think we can say we've accomplished a lot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, there's a one-sheeter for the LAR summary and a one-pager for the Tier 1 summary, so. I'm big on keeping things to one page <laughs> when possible. <laughs> you and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, item uh, agenda items uh, one through four are proposed rules, I believe. <laughs> Somebody that. Uh, they were all on the consent calendar. Oh, okay. Sorry. We're at lunch. Okay. So there's a item. Item five L is uh, lunch. So let's go to lunch. <laughs> More like brunch. Yeah. We'll have a brunch. Uh, we have one item left on the agenda, and that's agenda item five M adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Is any further discussion? If none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries, and the meeting of uh, the Committee on Affordability, Accountability, and Planning is adjourned. <laughs>